Hello, painters and pallbearers. My name is TV Sky, and a little while back, I did a video exploring what I think are the most beautiful splash art in League of Legends. With the benefit of over a decade of time and the skills of some of the most talented artists in the game industry, there is an embarrassment of riches to pick from, and narrowing down my previous list was tough. So, since I wasn't sure how that video would be received, I just asked, would people like to see another one? Well, the comments seemed to be enthusiastic, and the video did do pretty well in the engagement numbers that it's technically my job to care about, so here we go again. Now, these are not going to be THE most beautiful splash arts in League of Legends. I've kind of already made that list, but this will be a video about some of the many beautiful splash arts in League of Legends. I've picked out 10 this time around, and if this video goes over well too, maybe we can pick another 10 in the future. And much like last time, when I say beauty, that doesn't just mean that the splash art is pretty or that the art is technically competent. When I say beauty, I tend to talk about composition, light, color, and storytelling. So if there's a splash art on this list where you kind of don't understand how I find it particularly beautiful, well, it might just be because I look for a different kind of beauty than you do. Beauty is intrinsically pretty subjective, especially in art, and you are more than welcome to tell you about the splash arts that you love in the comments down below. Anyway, these are not in any particular order, except the order that was convenient for the script. So let's get into it. First though, I have to pay the bills, so this video is sponsored by Skillshare. And if you've been around on YouTube, you've probably heard of them at least once already. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for people who want to explore their own creativity. If there's something you want to learn how to do, odds are pretty good that Skillshare can help. And if you sign up with the link in the description, you'll get a full month of access for free. Skillshare offers video series on self-organizing and prioritizing, including taking care of your mental health while trying to get work done. With a subscription, the classes are ad-free, with new premium classes launching every week, which are fully subtitled in Spanish, Portuguese, French, and German. And hey, since we're talking about art and rendering today, why not check out Digital Painting, How to Color a Character Like a Pro by Stephanie Berm. Berm is an artist in the games industry and takes you through a full step-by-step -step process of coloring and rendering a character to a high standard, including learning about light sources and ambient and shadows. You can find that and thousands of other inspiring classes on Skillshare, and the first 1,000 people who use the link in my description will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare. We will start with some nice, peaceful nature imagery. If you saw the last video, you might remember how we talked about how artists create scale in an image. In order for the human brain to understand scale, it needs something to scale by, an object or a character for which it has an intuitive sense of its size and mass. The most common such object is a person, the thing which we understand most intimately, but anything of a known size will do. So, if I just show you this ball against a black background, well, the only reference you have for the ball's size is how big it happens to be in the picture displayed on your monitor. But if I add a human character in there, well, instantly your brain has kind of an intuitive sense of how big it is. So, looking at Hecarim here, we can compare him to the size of the environment, and from that we can tell that he's pretty big. How big exactly, though, is a little bit more... Hmm, a size of a bull moose? Well, he's probably bigger than that. Size of a truck, maybe? A house? Well, I have a small confession. This isn't actually the real Elderwood Hecarim splash art. I did a very quick and dirty Photoshop job. This is the real splash art. And what I want you to notice is just how much easier it is to get the size of Hecarim now. The birds perched on his shoulders, the deer drinking quietly of the stream at his feet. Before... You could figure out that he's big, sorta, of, but it was hard to tell exactly how much. But now, with these other reference points in the image, you feel that he is big. But let's go back to my quick and dirty Photoshop job, because it's also meant to illuminate something else. Notice what happens to the mood of the image when I take the animals away. It's not quite the same feeling, is it? Imagine walking through the woods and coming upon this scene. With no animals there, yeah, the nature is still lush, but the complete absence of other life creates a tension. It looks silent, doesn't it? And Hecarim himself, with those glowing red eyes, with that sharp masked face and the axe raised, it looks threatening in a predatory way, almost. 
but add the animals back in and the mood changes. The story changes. Now there's motion. Now there's life. There's activity. It looks like bird song and hooves beating through the undergrowth. It looks like life. And that changes so much about what the image is saying. Now, rather than a scene of silent menace, Hecarim becomes what he's supposed to be in the skin's lore. He becomes a protector. The birds perched peacefully on his shoulders, the deer drinking at his feet. These animals trust him. They are at peace with him. They congregate around his feet. They use him as something to rest on. And now, Hecarim's gesture, that axe, changes context. When he stands there now, one leg raised, staring at you with his axe raised, he's not a predator getting ready to pounce on you. Despite the glowing red eyes behind the mask, he doesn't even really look evil. He looks protective. His axe is now raised as if to say, if you mess with them, you mess with me. And this is a big part of where I find beauty in this splash art. There's so much subtle, effective communication happening. There's a story being told. You see this artwork, and without a word of description, you understand something about who this character is, what they want, how they are in the world, and that's actually really hard to do. It's also just a really good composition. The two trees here in the foreground form a V shape, a wedge in the middle of the image, which captures and directs your attention. It literally frames the main part of Hecarim's body for you. It's aided in this, of course, by the light, which is dappled and soft through the forest canopy, and which is at its brightest right behind his head, which highlights him. And the light is actually a little interesting because it is sparse. Hecarim is mostly in shadow. The light only falls on a few key parts of his body, lighting him just enough to make him stand out without ever really separating him from the forest, which is also part of how he's rendered. Looking closely at him, you can see the network of root armor across his chest is hanging with cobweb-like strands of ancient foliage, and the rocky armor on his body is patched with moss. So there's a point to not separating him too much from the environment because, well, in the storytelling, he's part of the environment. Elderwood Hecarim is not necessarily the most immediately striking splash art, but its storytelling is genuinely immaculate. God, this skin does not deserve a splash art that pretty. I'll remind you, Marquis Vladimir in-game looks like this. This is a thing that is still in League of Legends in current year argument 2022. I am not kidding when I say that a number of Vladimir splash arts constitute a form of false advertising. Like, I think this might be very slightly illegal. And there is no splash art that is more false advertising than Marquis Vladimir, which casts Vladimir as this Lestat-like charming aristocrat draining the life out of one of his marks whom he has lured away from the social ball. And in looking at it, we'll start where the splash art wants us to start. Vladimir's pretty boy face and the woman's neck lit by a shaft of moonlight falling from above. Except that's not all that's going on. Yes, the light is coming from above, but the way it reflects and refracts off the woman's skin isn't really naturalistic. Her throat is not merely lit, it is glowing, casting light on Vladimir's face. It creates a subtle but noticeable unnatural effect, drawing our attention to this as the focal point of the image, as well as, you know, just being kind of creepy, which fits the vibe. And there's storytelling here. As we've discussed in the previous video, light and highlighting are typically used to designate subjects. If you want to know who is the main character of an image, well, the light is usually the thing that tells you that. Vladimir's face is lit here, but the woman's isn't. Her throat is lit. Vladimir is the main character of this image, and the woman, her face, her identity, who she is, what she wants, those things are simply not important. All that matters is her vulnerability to Vladimir. This is dehumanization. The image treats the woman like an object, which in this instance is kind of correct. That is the story that's being told here. This image is Marquis Vladimir's splash art. It's telling the story from his point of view, and from his point of view, an object is all that this woman is. She's a thing which he's taking advantage of. You can compare and contrast with this artwork from Legends of Runeterra. This is the Crimson Disciple and the Crimson Aristocrat, who, as you can tell, are just the best of gal pals. 
<laughs> they are Vladimir's followers practicing blood magic that he has taught them, and the action that's happening here is essentially kind of the same that's happening in the Marquis Vladimir's Blashard. One character is using their magic to manipulate another, but the character dynamic is very different here, and it comes from the framing. Both characters are centered, their faces are visible, their relationship and interaction are core to the image. This image is about the quietly confident manipulation of the aristocrat, yes, but it's also about the exhilaration of the disciple who's being manipulated. The feelings, the experiences, the wants, the character of both characters matters. They are both subjects of the image. It doesn't make either of them into an object. And this reveals something to us about Vladimir's character. The way that he's treating this woman, the way that the image is treating this woman, reveals something about his character, his coldness and his cruelty, perhaps his narcissism. It's all to say that the posture and posing, the use of this victim character is intentional. She's not posed like that just because that's how a vampire's victim should be posed. She's posed like that because it says something. Speaking of which, by the way, this splash art pulls off a spectacular bit of having your cake and eating it too, because, yeah, Vladimir is depicted as a European aristocrat whose design directly references an Anne Rice character looming over the exposed throat of a swooning woman by moonlight, and literally anyone who sees this knows that he's a vampire. He's obviously a vampire. Of course he's a vampire. Except, of course, he's not. Much like Vladimir in-game isn't technically a vampire, neither is Marquis Vladimir. No, technically, he's draining her life with his hand, see? His fingers on her neck are lighting up all the veins under her skin where her blood is, but he's not technically doing a vampirism. There's no blood draining, there's no teeth, there's no biting. Is this to avoid censorship? I mean, who knows? Maybe they just didn't want to get sued by Anne Rice's estate for the obvious, uh inspiration, but whatever the case, this is a very well-executed little trick. The image makes everyone in the audience think vampire without ever actually depicting the one thing that vampires are most famous for doing. The effect, though, of Vladimir's draining touch is a great place to start when we want to look at some of the other beautiful features of this image. Look at how this is executed. We've got these reds and pinks and just a touch of pale purples that all spider web out from under his touch and outline the veins in her throat with an inner glow, almost kind of like what it looks like if you put a strong flashlight behind your fingers. It lights her up from inside of the skin. And that kind of subtle lighting effect is some of what this skin actually does most brilliantly. If you look over here on Vladimir's sleeve where he's holding her hand, first of all, the draining effect is happening here too, just much more subtly, but look at those frilly sleeves, man. Like, look at how the artist uses those little touches of edge lighting and gradients, shifting the color, allowing the warm glow of the party to filter through and light up the sleeve's edges. It's subtle, but even the most white of the sleeve fabric over here is warmer and redder in tone than the sleeve over on the right. And I don't want to oversell that as some kind of magic, it's just good color theory. I just want to highlight that the artist, when painting this figure, isn't just thinking about what colors Vladimir himself is, but what colors dominate the light in his environment. And they make subtle corrections to the temperature of the color that they're using to match it. And there is a storytelling point to that, by the way. It's not just cosmetic. The image here is about how Vladimir has seduced this woman and isolated her so that he can drain the life out of her. He has taken her from the party, where she would be safe from him, to the outside space where she's vulnerable to him. So look at the left of the image here. This is the party. This is safety. And the light here is warm and inviting and soft. There are people there. On the right side of the image, well, this is the outside, this is danger, and the light here is much brighter and sharper, and all of the colors are cold. The boundary between these two places in the image is this pillar. It's lit on the left with the warm glow, and on the right by the outside light, and this gives some more context to the posing of the characters as well. Vladimir is sweeping this woman out. He's holding her by her hand and around her back, almost as though waltzing with her. His body is between her and safety. Her outstretched arm, which is reaching into the safe zone of the image, is being grasped by Vladimir, controlling it, controlling her. Which is part of what makes this image beautiful to me. The fact that the light inside is warm and the light outside is cold is the sort of thing that's, you know, just the fact of life. Moonlight looks cold, but those attributes of the light are being used to contribute to the storytelling. 
even if you don't go through and analyze all of this, you feel the difference between these two spaces. You feel that outside is cold and harsh and that inside is warm and safe. And the artist has used that perfectly to support what they're trying to say with the image. Anyway, a thing that isn't relevant to the storytelling or anything, but which is just kind of rad and I wanted to point it out, those metal embroideries and decorations on the side of the woman's corset, like, look at these. Those look amazing, man. Like, this is fiddly stuff to try and draw and render. It's really detailed, dense, but look how nicely they painted the rim of all of those little embroideries. You can see the metallic glow that they have in the light. That's just, oh, that's just really good. It looks really nice. To me, Dragon Trainer Heimerdinger is all about one thing. There's one part of this image that is the keystone that absolutely makes the rest of it, that ties it together. And it's this. One gloved hand gently peeling away slimy eggshell from a newly hatched baby dragon. But we'll start with the light, because as usual, the light designates our subject, which are Heimerdinger and the baby dragon he's cuddling. It's a scene of tenderness, for which reason the light is soft and golden and genuinely quite warm. And if you want to understand why that's important, imagine the opposite. Imagine that all the lights and the colors, like in the part of Vladimir's splash art with the woman's outside, imagine that it's all that sharp and that cold. That would be weird, right? Like that would clash against the tenderness of the moment between these two characters. It kind of needs to be warm. The light kind of needs to be golden and soft. The composition of the image is exceedingly simple. The subject is merely centered and lit, with the background and the foreground arranged such that it creates a sort of frame around them. You can overlay an oval onto the image like so to see the rough shape of it. The blurring of the image also serves this function. Broadly speaking, in this image, the closer something is to our subjects, the more in focus it is, and the further away, the more blurred it becomes. So the dragon here in the deep background, probably the mother of these pups, is very blurred indeed, while the baby dragon off to the right here is a bit more in focus, and the baby dragon that's hovering around Heimer's hair almost isn't blurred at all. On a camera, or in the human eye, this kind of focusing and blurring are just like properties of the lens, but in a piece of artwork, it's a series of conscious choices made by the artist. Like, they could have rendered everything in clarity, but they chose not to because it does something. And what it does, and what the light does, is storytelling, which brings us back to that hand, the gesture. This image is about dragon trainer Heimerdinger and his relationship to the dragons that he cares for. There are many ways you could depict that. Like, for instance, you could show him training dragons on a field somewhere, running drills, having them breathe fire on targets. You could give him a cool action shot, deploying his dragons in a fight like he does in-game, commanding them, dominating the battlefield. But, but that's not really what his character is about. Dragon trainer Heimerdinger isn't just a trainer. He's a father to these little guys. When this dragon struggled out of its egg and into the world, he was there to hold it and soothe it and to pick the slimy bits of egg off of it. Where Dragon Trainer Tristana and Lulu are all about going on adventures with their fun dragon companions, Heimerdinger is about taking care of them, raising them, nurturing them. Which is why that gesture is so important, because that right there is the action of a parent. Not just cuddling the cute dragon, but while cuddling it, while soothing it, also just picking off a bit of dirt here and there, cleaning a little bit, taking care of them in the ways that they can't take care of themselves yet. That gesture right there, at least to me, is the thing that makes the difference between being a dragon trainer and a dragon caretaker. And this is reinforced by the rest of the image. For example, a little bit of Heimerdinger's hair is on fire, and it's on fire because another newly hatched dragon, this little rascal, has just spat flames at him. And again, this is such a parent thing. Babies throw things, they vomit, they poop themselves, and a great parent just has to roll with it. Oh, my hair is on fire. Well, it shall have to wait until this little fellow is fully out of his egg. <laughs> oh, you remind me of myself when I was your age, my boy. I too was always causing fires. It's that vibe, right? And then there's the other dragon hovering behind him whose tail is tangled in his hair, almost as though it's been either nesting there or if it just likes to weave in and out of it. Either way, that casual tail just resting there is a sign of intimacy, of comfort, of closeness. 
Just like in Hecarim's art, where the presence of birds and animals around him told us that they feel safe and comfortable around him, the same thing applies here. The dragons are comfortable around Heimerdinger. Mama Dragon is sleeping peacefully in the background, and we understand what kind of relationship he has to these creatures. He cares for them, and they quite like him too. Which is where the beauty is, I think. This is an image about love. Not complex love, not adult love, not the depths of emotional entanglement between complex people, but pure, saccharine, simple adoration without a drop of cynicism or self-consciousness. And that probably doesn't work on everyone, but it does work on me. A question some people have about this splash art is, hang on, what's TF doing here? Isn't he married to Graves? Why is he romancing Evelyn? And I would respond to that by first saying that, you know, bisexuals exist, but also, there's a lot of things happening in this image, and I don't think any of them are romance. And once again, let's start with the light. This is a splash art about two dancers in the spotlight, so there's a very strong light source beaming down on them from above. It's so strong that the background, the environment, the entire scene that they're occupying essentially fades into the darkness, becomes this unspecific stage space of some kind. It is, in that way, somewhat reminiscent of Baroque art, which likes to do a similar thing, to eliminate the physical space of its environments and center the characters instead. And this centering of the subjects radiates quite literally, through the entire image. Everything in this image is swirling, flowing, flying, and all of it is swirling around TF and Evelyn. Twisted Fate's cards, the rose petals, Evelyn's streamers, they all create an eye of the storm wherein we find our subjects. This defines the entire mood of the picture, and it's part of why I say that whatever else is happening here, romance isn't. Now take a look at the composition. We're working with a Dutch angle. That's a term used to describe the horizon line being tilted the way that this is. And the usual function of that angle is to create a sense of instability, a sense that things are in motion, that they're changing, that there's some kind of drama happening. Again, think back on the previous splashes. Heimerdinger had a standard angle because his scene is one of quiet, loving peace. Hecarim had a standard angle because it is a peaceful and quiet forest scene. He's only threatening violence if anyone disturbs it. But Vladimir had a Dutch angle because this is the moment of predation. It is the moment that he takes his victim. It's not an action scene, but it's meant to be unsettling. It's a moment of violence. So TF and Evelyn get a Dutch angle, but why? They're just dancing, right? Well, yeah, but look at them. He's stepping forward around her, grabbing her waist. She's got her leg under him and she's pulling him by his tie. They are fixing each other in their gaze, staring directly into one another's eyes while their hands hold prepared either Evelyn's deadly claws or TF's gold card. This is not dancing, this is a power play. It's a standoff. This is two people, each looking for the moment that the other one blinks first. Hence the tension of the Dutch angle. Hence the pedals and the streamers and the cards whirling all around them. Hence the bright spotlight separating them from any sense of place and time. Everything in this image is here. It is in the brief space between the two of them, the distance from the one to the other. That right there, that is the tension. Everything else in the splash art is swirling, whirling, building up, just waiting for that to snap. That is the storytelling of this image. So. What about the art itself? Well, the light really is the star of the show here. It is that big, bright, powerful spotlight that gives the image so much of its dramatic pop. Evelyn's hair, for example, a bright blonde in this splash art, is practically radiant under that light. The light makes TF and Evelyn pop out of the background like stars because they're so brightly lit. Again, compare and contrast with Hecarim, whose lighting was specifically designed not to make him pop out of the background. The flowers in Evelyn's hair become such a powerful contrast with the rest of her head, specifically because of those bright, defining edge lights around their petals. Those flowers, by the way, god damn, look at that rendering. Like, look at the texturing on these things. Look how soft and gorgeous they look. Most people wouldn't look at the splash art in nearly high enough resolution to really see these, but 
damn, the artist went ham on those. Then there's the tie, and this gesture, like this idea of having Evelyn pulling on a literal rope that's tied around TF's neck, it adds so much to the power play between them. Because in this image, TF is the one leaning in, he's leading the dance, and Evelyn is leaning back away from him. And that runs the risk of upsetting the balance in the image. Like, uncontested, that might make TF feel too powerful, too much like he's in control of what's happening. So, Evelyn grabs his tie and pulls on it. She asserts a bit of control. She quite literally grabs a leash on him. And I'm really a fan of the subtle rendering on her hand here. Like, it's just the faintest little strokes of a brighter skin color showing the tension in her hand as she grabs the tie. Those little ridges along the back of her hand that you can just barely see there. But it's enough. The hand is tense, the grip is firm, it becomes a gesture of power. I also really like the way that the light is done along Evelyn's back here, because we have the spotlight from above creating those almost pure white edge light ridges along her shoulders, but then down at the surface of the back we get this warm shadow which is lit very subtly from below. That's the light of the spotlight bouncing back off the stage, creating almost the sense of a glow on her back, and it's being used to outline the shape of her to give her volume. This little crack in the line here, like where it suddenly changes direction, that gives tension to that waiting hand with the claw out on the left. That sort of prepares us for the idea, okay, the muscles are flexing, she's just waiting for her moment. And off that same shoulder, there's that strap for her dress. Okay, um, when there's a piece of clothing that like has these shoulder straps, right? Like they're supposed to hold it up. And then one strap like just slides off the shoulder a little bit. Like it's not a wardrobe malfunction. Nothing's been revealed. Like there's no anything. But when the strap has just like fallen off the shoulder, that is hotter than lingerie. It just is. I'm right and I will not explain myself. Anyway, speaking of clothes, there's a lot of motion and gesture in them as well. Look at the swirl in Evelyn's dress and all that motion and movement it imparts to her. And the same with TF's jacket. It all helps accentuate this sense of swirling, twisting, circling around each other. It sort of helps reveal the flirting of the moment, that searching for a lethal opening that they're both doing. Once again, for me, a lot of the beauty here is in the storytelling, the interplay between the two characters, but the use of light, those powerful saturated contrasts, those are damn pretty to look at too. This is a splash art that kind of doesn't need a lot of explaining. It's also a skin where the beauty really isn't in the storytelling so much because Frankly, no story is really being told here. There's some metal Cossacks in the room, and there's some ominous mask dudes with swords standing around. It's the 2017 World Championship skin. It doesn't really have character or narrative. It doesn't really need it, either, because this art is all about the shine. It's all about that exquisite metal rendering. And much like with TF and Evelyn, we have a spotlight effect being used here with a powerful light from the top down illuminating our main subject and leaving the rest of the scene in relative shadow. That powerful light then also becomes the source of all the razzle dazzle. There's tons and tons of metallic glow effects shining off of every surface on Cossack's body. And there's a really simple striking color palette here. We're working with sky blue, silvery gray, and gold, with some darker grays and blues for contrast in between them. Especially the crest on Cossack's forehead shows the power of that contrast. Like, look how much that gold stands out against the duller gray of his armor. Look how much it shines. And those contrast surfaces are a constant in the image, with the gold especially acting as a highlight against the rest of them. That alone, however, wouldn't really be enough to make the image pop, so there's a couple of extra things thrown in here. First, there's the wings, which are a pair of bright blue wedges of power, which stand out brilliantly against the rest of his colors, and which take on the hue of the glow in his eyes as well, and thus it becomes kind of an expression of his life force? I mean, I'm not sure if he's supposed to be like a robot or a golem here or whatever, but it is an outward expression of the glow that animates him from the inside. It brings a sense of life to him and prevents him from just kind of looking like a statue. 
The other thing that's being added is whatever that effect is that's happening along the edges of his blades. I don't know if that's supposed to be his evolution effect or his optical camouflage, but it doesn't really matter. What matters is that we have these erratic little blotches with glowing edges in the gold that create points of interest and texture along the edges of his blade. Because the blades are otherwise pretty uniform, and they do kind of run the risk of looking a little bland, even with their gold edges, and so this effect breaks the monotony a little bit. It draws the eye, and also helps create motion in the character. The ridges and edges around that gold effect is throwing particles off of him, and that creates a sense of motion, like Kha'Zix has just whipped his blades around. Like I said, the beauty in this splash art really doesn't need much explanation. You kind of just look at this, and you get why it's cool. Captain Gangplank is a scary mother It's not immediately obvious when you first see the splash art. He just kind of seems to be posing in a pirate ship hold. The first thing you're likely to notice is either his face or the edge of the saber, which catches the light as it's slicing through the skin of a juicy orange. Which is a funny thing about this art. Remember, light tends to designate the main subject of a piece of art. That which is highlighted tends to be the focus of attention. And here, that focus of attention is that drooling, succulent, almost kind of sinfully juicy orange spilling its moisture all over Gangplank's gloves. There's a meme effect of that, of course. Gangplank and oranges are an iconic pair. But I think there's also a storytelling point being made with this. Because Gangplank is scary, right? And the reason that he's scary is the thing that you'll notice second or third, which is the point of view of the artwork. Our point of view. Because we are seeing this image from inside the head of the poor bastard whose hands are hanging there in chains. Those hands are rendered deeply in shadow, basically only showing up with a tiny bit of edge lighting, so you're not meant to see them right away. It's meant to be essentially kind of a surprise. And you can imagine the cinematic version of this idea, right? Like the darkness fades and the camera looks up, and then you see that saber slowly peeling the skin off an orange, and you look further up and you see Gangplank's face, and then you look around and oh, oh no. Those are your hands in the shackles. That's the kind of story that's being told here. And in that context, Gangplank just sort of casually peeling an orange becomes kind of a terrifying thing. It becomes an intimidation tactic. When you notice that red-hot glow on his sword, you begin to realize that, oh, oh no, he's about, he's about to torture this person, and he doesn't seem bothered by that at all. In fact, his expression is almost kind of anticipatory. He's peeling an orange, he's grinning just a little bit because he's about to have fun. It's very effective storytelling for the kind of person that Gangplank is, for the kind of role that he played in Bilgewater as its Reaver King. And the only thing the splash art actually did to achieve this is pose Gangplank in a particular way and look at him from a particular point of view. Anyway, there's something worth talking about in the composition, too, because if you pay attention, you'll notice that it's very symmetrical. Gangplank is right in the middle of the image. There's a stairway right in the center of his back with light pouring out that sort of illuminates him. There are cannons flanking him on each side, and even the hands of the prisoner are more or less symmetrical in the image. And symmetry, visually, is a really effective tool to create a sense of the static, of the deliberately posed, of the well-ordered. Now look at Gangplank, though, and you see that he breaks the symmetry. His shoulders are askew, his head is twisted sideways and down, he's got that long saber poking way the hell out to one side of the image, he's got a gun only on one side, everything else in the image is confined to symmetry, right? Like, the prisoner is confined to symmetry. Gangplank alone breaks it, he unbalances it, it marks him out as the person who has the power to act in this image, the person who's in control. It cements his power, and that power is what this otherwise kind of quiet and still image is all about. You could have so easily depicted Gangplank in the middle of an epic battle, cutting down five guys with his sword and being badass, but if you want to tell a story about how scary Gangplank is, this is the way to do it.
We continue with yet another scary monster, but one that's scary in a somewhat different way than Gangplank. In the previous video, we talked about triangular compositions or pyramid compositions, wherein a character rises out of the image and dominates it by taking up a pyramid-like shaped portion of the image. Now, this is not some Renaissance golden proportion math magic so much as it's just a natural way to frame an image, but it's a visual language that we all recognize. You see this image and you know instinctively that Spirit Blossom Cassiopeia is powerful. You know that she's dangerous. And that comes first from the fact that she literally dominates the image. Her form is this rising figure towering over everything else. And that's part of what a triangular composition does. It creates this shape language of dominance. Her tail also slings its way across the entire bottom of the image. So she controls this space. She reaches everywhere. The other thing is that like with Gangplank, there is a particular point of view. Now, we're not inhabiting explicitly a character in the same way as we were in the Gangplank splash art, but if you look at the perspective in this image, imagine where you would have to be to look at her in this way. You'd have to be below her, either laying flat on the floor or just much smaller than she is. What also gives her power in the image is her affect, her posture, because she's not like, say, an Ivern type leaning down and saying, oh, hello there, who are you? She's got her back straight, the shoulders back, that casual hand laying across her midriff, and she's not even tilting her head to look at you. No, she's just glancing down at you like she's noticing a speck of dust or a bug. And interestingly, her expression isn't even, like, malicious. It's not a look that says, oh, I shall torture this victim. It's more like mild surprise or curiosity. She's cocking one eyebrow and the lips are slightly parted, almost as though to say, oh, what's this that has found its way into my parlor? And while it's frightening to be looked at by someone like Gangplank, an evil guy who wants to kill you, there's another kind of fear to being observed by something that is overwhelming, huge, and powerful that considers you utterly insignificant. Anyway, light and composition. And the main source of light in here is that purple glow, Cassiopeia's power, those snake spirits darting through the air. It's another thing that cements her as dominant in the image. And again, the snake spirits are definitely scary, but they're not coming for you, the viewer. They're going somewhere else, because remember, you're insignificant. You're almost more in danger of being crushed by her tail on accident than killed on purpose. Compositionally, we're also working with the Dutch angle again, and here it makes for a rather interesting choice because I think it would have been easy to create this image with a horizontal composition. In fact, let's do a little bit of Photoshop magic and try it now. Huh. And yeah, this image still works, but the mood has changed, hasn't it? Remove that tilted, unbalanced angle and the image becomes quieter, it becomes more stable, it feels less anxious. Hell, the swoop of her long tail has even become almost symmetrical now. It changes the feeling of the storytelling that's happening in the image. It changes the feeling of what it would be like to be the point of view. And it's not that straightening the angle doesn't work. It's not that the image doesn't have Cassiopeia in a dominant, domineering, powerful position. It's just, it doesn't feel the same to look at her, does it? It doesn't communicate that same sense of worry and anxiety about her. Here, she looks more like a grand, gorgeous, but rather still statue, almost. And it's a fascinating thing that just a few degrees of a tilt can do that much to the perception of an image. Anyway, let's look at some gorgeous details in this image that I really appreciate. First, those snake bite markings by Cassiopeia's mouth. Up close, they're clearly makeup or tattoos or some kind of marking on her skin or something, but from far away, you could mistake them for dripping blood or poison, which that's a good way to make her spooky. Then there's the tiny little snake scales around the corners of her eyes. It adds some character and texture to her face, albeit I do wish it went a little bit further than it does. I really like this statue down on the lower right, both because of that streak of light on the inside of the nose ridge, it gives the whole statue so much form, but also, do you see the end of Cassiopeia's tail twirling around his windpipe there? It's so casual, and it's so much in the background that you barely notice it when you're looking at the whole picture, and yet, 
It's a threatening gesture, isn't it? It makes you worry what might happen the moment Cassiopeia doesn't find you insignificant anymore. Finally, a thing that does deserve to be appreciated more about this splash art is the folding screen behind her. Not just the swooping snake whose scales are rendered with these beautiful, subtle, bright lines, but also those gorgeously stylized flowers. Those are just really pretty. A complaint I see occasionally, and which sometimes I agree with, is that League of Legends art can be generic. And this is true, a lot of it exists within a very standard aesthetic paradigm, a very middle-of-the-road western fantasy gaming aesthetic. But one thing that should be said in Riot's favor on that point is that they very much helped create that aesthetic. League's explosive success in the late 2000s inspired a lot of imitation, including aesthetic imitation. And so League's art style is a huge part of the foundation that created this now fairly ubiquitous standard Western fantasy game style. Which is one of the reasons why Nila's splash art is exciting to me. It's not that this is a revolutionary new paradigm for League of Legends splash art or anything, it's still recognizable as League art, it follows the Riot House style, and yet, there's something that has shifted here, I think. If we compare with another couple of recent champions like Zeri or Renata Glask, both of those splashes have what I would consider kind of a more cartoony style to them. Not so much in terms of the character design. Nila is, if anything, more of a cartoon character in her design than Renata is, but in the way that the splash art approaches light and surface rendering. Nila's splash art is in part not more realistic, but in a sense more naturalistic. Look at Nila's face compared to Renata's, for example. If you look close, you can see a texture on Nila, almost like brushwork. It has a kind of flow around her features that gives her skin a certain texture. The lines follow the movement of the lines in her face. Looking at Renata Glask, her splash art uses a more stylized, slightly flatter rendering style. Zeri's face has that same somewhat flatter look as well, and if you compare the way that Zeri's hair is rendered to Nila, you can look at how much the light interacts with Nila's hair by comparison. And I don't make these comparisons in a derogatory way, this is not to criticize Zeri or Renato's splash arts, they have a different approach, but I am incredibly impressed with how Nila is rendered here. Especially the brush stroke texture on her skin gives her volume and form to me in a way that kind of reminds me of Arcane a little bit. Not necessarily by way of a direct comparison, but it seems to be a similar kind of thinking about rendering. I also just appreciate good texture on skin. It's something which I feel like a lot of art styles are just scared of using for fear that a character might look unappealing somehow, I guess. But Neela here demonstrates that that doesn't have to be true at all. It's another lesson I wish that people would learn from the character design of Arcane, honestly. Something else to appreciate about Nila's splash is the fabric. I mean, just look at this. You can see the golden thread, the individual little stitches in the designs that decorate her tunic. One criticism I saw of Nila's design is that a lot of people felt it was too simple, and that's probably because her in-game model just can't really render this level of detail. In-game, her tunic looks like a flat yellow, essentially, but here we can clearly see the idea that they were going for. A monocolored fabric whose detailing is all about embroidery and texture, and just look at the way the light is rendered on this. Look at the way it falls along the volume and the folds. This is so gorgeous. And the final thing to appreciate is the demon orb on her hip. It uses bright blue, white, and lilac purples and swirls them around each other to produce this really gorgeous otherworldly glow effect. Like, look at the center of the orb especially, how the middle is actually kind of duller than the edges which glow more strongly. It's an abstract and weird shape design that kind of fits the idea that there's a demon trapped in there. It's a really gorgeous little object, and the streamers of water sort of twisting and swirling out of it are just gorgeous to look at. There's a couple of things we've already talked about that come back into play with Star Nemesis Fiddlesticks. And first is the scale. See, you could look at this splash all day in its standard definition and never really get a great sense of the scale of the characters in it. Fiddlesticks is jumping around this surreal chessboard, but it's hard to really tell what the size of anything is supposed to be 
until you look at the lower right corner and realize, oh, sh that's a Kali. That is the size of a human. Which means that Fiddlesticks here is actually kind of big. In fact, she's huge. And I say she because, well, in Star Guardians, that's what Fiddlesticks is, a former Star Guardian who fell completely to chaos and the dark. And now she is this thing. And in a splash like Elderwood Hecarim, all of the storytelling is kind of intrinsically in the image. Like, you don't need to know the Coven Elderwood Eclipse lore to understand it, and knowing that lore doesn't really enrich his splash art that much. Star Nemesis Fiddlesticks, however, really can't be fully understood without knowing some of the Star Guardian lore. Like, the details of how this character design works and what's going on here is too specific to be communicated in just the image itself. And that's kind of fine. The balancing act in the storytelling here is to tell enough of the story that an outsider with no knowledge can get the gist of it, even without the specifics. And it does that genuinely quite well. First, there's the imagery. We are in this bizarre, tilted, shattering chessboard environment where the black pieces look like the monster, they look like fiddlesticks, and the white pieces look like people. Combined with Fiddle's permanent smile and those coquettish, permanently posed hands under her chin, you kind of infer that, oh, okay, this is some kind of scary nightmare monster, but it's like a playful scary nightmare monster. She's playing a game. She's sort of murderous and whimsical at the same time. And as you keep looking at her, you catch sight of that thing in her chest, that cute little unicorn-looking sort of creature. It's in a cage, and it looks really sad, so... Oh, okay, it's trapped in there, so Fiddlesticks is a scary, whimsical nightmare monster within which something innocent is trapped. Huh. And that comes down in part to the way that the image is framed and the way that the composition is constructed. It wouldn't be hard to pose Fiddle such that the creature in her chest wouldn't be visible, but the light pulls us in the first instance to Fiddle herself, then to her face, and then eventually you catch sight of that glow inside the relative shadow of her chest that attracts your eye, and then you kind of get it, or at least you have a chance to get it. The storytelling of this image is doing a fantastic job of trying to clarify the character to us within the limitations of not being able to, you know, spell anything out. And frankly, it's doing a really good job at this. I really like the light in this image too. It's pouring into the scene from above through this shattered roof. It's white and kind of stark and it glows in a sort of fuzzy way off of everything that really enhances the sense of a nightmare, of a bad dream. Surreal landscapes with weird lighting and crumbling proportions and the black and white design aesthetic of the environment, that chessboard, also gives Fiddlesticks herself that much more space to shine, quite literally. Her psychedelic weird neon colors absolutely pop against the starkness of the surroundings and it enhances the nightmarish weirdness of everything that's going on. Imagine, by contrast, if she was depicted battling the Star Guardians in a colorful space nebula, for example. Imagine how much less her wild, gaudy colors would stand out in the image. So putting her here in this chessboard environment is just a really good choice. Also, and this is just a little thing, but look at the glove over there on the left. Look at the fabric. You can see the knitwork in it which in terms of texture is almost a little bit weird compared with the satin smoothness of the rest of Fiddlesticks' clothes. It has a handmade quality to it that's kind of peculiar. I don't know if it means anything, but it's, it's some really nice rendering on that knitted glove. This is the image that comes into my head now when I think about gothic western horror. I saw High Noon Thresh, and it replaced whatever else it was that was there before, I don't remember, because to me, this is the distillation of that idea. And partly, it's for obvious reasons. We've got a skull-headed demon with bullhorns whose head is aflame, bursting out of a body that is dressed in cowboy gear, sort of, but all f***ed up and distorted by demonic spikes. And he's not howling or screaming or cackling with glee, swinging his deadly noose around or whatever. He's just sitting there, letting the lashes of a dust storm wash over him and whipping up his coat while he waits. What he's waiting for, I mean, who knows? The next fool who stops at this crossroads, probably. But he's not waiting in just any random dusty place on the map, it turns out. Once you look around, once you peer through the dust and the gloom, you'll start to notice bodies. 
First, perhaps, you notice the man burning in the dirt back there, his body dappled with these fiery wounds, rather like a red-hot bony rope had been dragged over him. Then, down at Thresh's feet, charred and smoldering hands are curled up, hinting at something awful just out of the frame. By his foot on the other side, barely visible under the edge of his coat, even a vulture lies dead on the ground. The scavengers, the messengers of death, have still not survived Thresh's presence. Perhaps most creepy though, over here on the right you can see... I mean, it's definitely a cow's ribcage in the foreground of this, but what are those dark and mangled shapes behind it? Like, is that just a bit of desert brush? Is it rocks? But, hmm. Thresh isn't, as it seems at first glance, sitting there alone. He's sitting there with his victims which is what makes this image good horror. There's no jump scare, there's no sudden BOO of dead bodies and gory images. It reveals itself gradually, and the longer you stare at it, the longer you stay, the more awful things you start to realize are happening. And I also really like the use of light and color here, because everything in this image is brown. All of it. Even the things that you think are black, no, they're actually brown. Everything in this image is some shade of brown and red, except the fire. That alone skews into yellow and bright orange, and it makes Thresh so striking in this environment. The dust storm constrains visibility, it lowers the light, it traps you with him. The only things that are here in this scene are Thresh, his victims, and you. And even if you were to run, where would you go? You wouldn't know where to go. You can't see anything. And again, imagine that the scene was different. Imagine he was sitting under a clear night sky or in the daytime. It wouldn't work the same. This is an image that has menace. It's an image that feels like you're sitting across from him while he's just quiet. He's not doing anything. He's not rearing the lasso up to take you. He's not pulling souls from his lantern to torment. He's just sitting there, and the dust storm beats across you both, and the only sounds are the howling wind and the crackling of his fiery soul pouring out from his neck. And there's nothing but open desert for a hundred miles around you, no walls, no cliffs, no canyons, and yet you are trapped in a dead, horrible place with something evil that knows it has all the time in the world to get you. This is what I think of when I think of gothic western horror. Hey, thank you very much for watching another video about some beautiful splash art in League of Legends. And uh, what's the mood, fellas? Do we want more of this? If so, let me know in the comments. There's a lot of splash art left that I could talk about, and I could take a look at some of the best cards from Legends of Runeterra, too, if you want. I made each segment in this video somewhat longer than they were in the previous one, and, um... Like, what do you think of that? Is this, uh, is it too long now? Did I linger too much on one splash? Should I go a little faster? And do you want me to get into the weeds of, like, really nerding out over texture and rendering and technical details? Or is it fun to hear more of a narrative analysis of the work like I did with Thresh there at the end? I do kind of need your feedback on this because I'm not really sure. And I will obviously also have to be looking at the YouTube numbers because, well, because it's my job to do that, to, to care about numbers. Ugh. If you want to help me with the numbers, you can like, comment, and subscribe, and you can play the emoji game with me. If you made it this far into the video, put a jack-o'-lantern emoji in your comment and I'll put a little heart on it. I know it's not Halloween anymore, but goddammit, it's still Halloween in my heart. Anyway, uh, it's a sponsored video, so I won't shill the Patreon, but I'll ask you once again to please follow me on Twitch and on my Let's Play channel. Pokemon and God of War Ragnarok are coming out soon, and I really want to see if I can't find the time to stream at least one of them. And not to toot my own horn or nothing, but I am a half-decent streamer. Like, you should come along and watch. In other news, I provided one of the voices for Necrit's huge video about the retcons that have happened in the story of League of Legends, so go check that out, link in the description. And I did some voice work for Aranok, who recently premiered her monster video essay about queer relativity. It's a very personal, very interesting essay that uses, among other things, Watchmen, Doctor Who, and Dark Souls 3 to explore some pretty complex ideas about what it means to create yourself as a person. There's a link to that in the description as well, and you should check it out. 
Okay, one last thing, I promise. If you are a YouTuber in the gaming space, and you make videos about some of the same stuff that I do, you know, art, narrative, character design, and so on, and you might be interested in creating a small essay for a video on my channel as a collaboration exercise, get in touch with my business email and send me a link to your work. I can't promise I'll answer very fast and I might not be able to answer everyone, but I am maybe possibly working on an idea for something and I want to see how many people would be vaguely interested. You don't have to commit, just like if you're interested, hit me up. Anyway, that's it. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Be kind to one another, have solidarity with those who are worse off than yourself, and may the tides of history wash gently over us all. Thank you.